Good evening, everyone. My name is Lisa Moon, and I am the Vice President of Global Agriculture and Food at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Thanks very much for coming out to join us this evening in spite of the cold. We are very happy to um, have you here for tonight's discussion on global development. You know, there is increasingly a recognition of the role that business can play in both driving economic growth and generating positive development outcomes. Some of the most thoughtful work on this topic has been led by the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Tonight's event. At this time, please silence your cell phones. However, we do encourage you to tweet and use other forms of social media throughout the event. <laughs> Before we get to our program, let me first mention to you a few upcoming events that may be of interest. On February 14th, we will be hosting the NSA Director Keith Alexander for a discussion about US Cyber Command and the National Security Agency. And on February 18th, Adam Posen, who's president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics, will discuss the global economy. Tonight's discussion is on the record and is being live streamed for audiences across the country. The audio and the video will be available on the Chicago Council's website and on the website of CSIS. Finally, this evening's event will be formally introduced by Mr. Lester Crown. Mr. Crown is the chairman of Henry Crown and Company and is also a leading philanthropist and civic leader. He is director of the Anne and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago, the Lyric Opera of Chicago, and serves, of course, as the chairman of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Please join me in welcoming Lester Crown to the stage. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Delighted to, that you're here tonight uh, for the evening with a discussion on global development and prosperity. I, I have to change what I was going to say because since we're waiting for Tom to show up, I was practicing speaking much more slowly. <laughs> and, well, tonight's event is a partnership that's brought to you, as Lisa said, by two institutions, the Chicago Council and the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And uh, I have the good fortune, as Tom does, to be involved in both of them. CSIS is really a prestigious 50-year-old organization that's headquartered in Washington that publishes strategic policy insights and features really some of the world's most prominent thinkers. Tonight's speakers, John Hamry, Catherine Pickus, and Thomas Pritzker, all worked on a very noteworthy report and that was released by CSIS just last year. It was called Our Shared Opportunity, A Vision for Global Prosperity. And it was documents why international development is important for the United States and explores why we are currently in a pivotal time for global engagement. The report goes on to uh, make some really policy recommendations on how the US government and the private sector can collaborate to continue supporting development initiatives and um, emerging economies. And the, tonight, the, our guests will tell us about the findings of the report. Since you have the official biography at your place, I'm really going to very briefly introduce them. Uh, John Hamry is the president, CEO, and holds the Pritzker chair of CSIS. He's previously served as chairman of the Defense Policy Board, as Under Secretary of Defense, and as a professional staff member of the Senate Armed Services Committee. And really, for your future, future reference, if you hear it, John Hamry. Uh, in, in not only in my opinion, but I think in many, many people's opinion, is one of the ablest and most knowledgeable foreign policy pros that is in the country. And it's really a pleasure having him here. Uh, uh, Kathy Pickus is the Divisional Vice President of Global Citizenship and Policy at Abbott. She formerly served as the Director of Corporate Communications for Food of the Loom and as Special Assistant for the National Security Affairs to the Vice President of the United States. Tom's Chairman and CEO of the Pritzker Organization and Executive Chairman of Hyatt Hotels. In addition, he is a member of the Board of Trustees of CSIS, University of Chicago, the, and the Art Institute 
uh, really, and, and many other things. And Chicago is very indebted to Tom and his family for what they have done. So <clears throat> after the, their discussion, Lisa's going to return and moderate a Q&A with you. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Tom, Kathy, John. You want me to start? Yes, okay. Sir. Can everybody hear? Is this okay? Good. So I'm the late Tom Pritzker. Um, I'm here wearing three hats tonight, as Lester mentioned. I'm the executive chairman of Hyatt, and as such, we have a vital interest in foreign affairs and particularly foreign assistance because we operate in many of the countries that are the beneficiaries of that. I'm on the board of CSIS. And then along with Tom Daschle, Carly Fiorini, and Vin Weber, I co-chaired the, the study, the commission that we're, we're talking about here. Uh, I wear a fourth hat, and that is I'm Margot's husband. Um, members of our group rep represented the group that did this study, represented leading corporations in the United States, NGOs, uh, government agencies and philanthropies so that we were getting input. We felt it was important to get input from cross-section of the people who would be interested uh, in this. We spent a year developing the ideas uh, for ways the U.S. can harness uh, the power of the private sector in terms of uh, our foreign policy and the dynamics of um, emerging market countries. Uh, this resulted in the report, which is available back there, uh, our shared opportunities, a vision for global prosperity. And that's what we want to discuss tonight. So let me start with the conclusion. The conclusion basically is that our foreign, assistant pro uh, foreign assistance programs should be reoriented around facilitating the economic growth of target countries. Uh, we should not only increase our focus on economic growth, but we should also integrate that concept fully into American economic and diplomatic efforts by making it fully integrated into American policy, American national security and foreign policy. So let me try and lay the foundation, or at least from my perspective, how I think about it. Um, I think the world is going to become a more dangerous place. I think as the U.S. recedes, whether it's by choice or economic necessity, I think that's going to leave a vacuum, and people are going to want to fill that vacuum, and that transition uh, may not be so pretty. When you add to that a second component of the increasing destructive power that hostile places will have, whether that's cyber or other types of things, you get a really dangerous, potentially dangerous world. The other side of that, to my way of thinking, is that what you've got now in, in developing countries, emerging market countries for the first time, is knowledge and communications that's really modern that's very up to date. Almost no matter where you go, if you're dealing with educated people, they understand what's going on in the world, they understand everything that we all understand. So if there's a way to drive their development, if there's a way to drive their economic prosperity, my own thinking is that's a, that's a tool that can be used to moderate the difficult world that I think that we're entering into. Um, in thinking about the new world, our council concluded that one of the most cost-efficient and effective responses to that world that I described would be to build an economic pillar to stand next to diplomatic and military capabilities and drive our foreign policy. So if, if right now we've got military and diplomatic, if we had military, diplomatic, and economic, we think that that would, that would be a much more effective foreign policy uh, set of tools that would be available to the government. 
Lastly, given the skills and resources and knowledge of the private sector in the United States, it's eminently doable and it's not expensive. We could, we could basically add this pillar because we're, we're not thinking in terms of grants. We're thinking in terms of helping with human capital. And that's not, that's not expensive. So we think we have the tools to do it, the skill sets in the private sector. We think it is not expensive to do with a, with a fraction of the cost of either DOD or um, USAID. We could add that third pillar to our foreign policy. And it would involve not only, not only advice on how to help build these strategies for building economies, but it also will be to our benefit because it'll affect trade. Trade is clearly an instrument that we would envision using uh, as a way to enhance the economies of these countries. So that's sort of the shorthand of, of what we discussed, some of the conclusions we came to, and, and how we tried to craft an idea for a cost-efficient but effective tool that could assist uh, our foreign policy. So um, that I wanted to frame that out. Uh, Kathy was involved the whole way, and, and it, was, it was actually a very interesting uh, project and an interesting set of discussions. So maybe I'll turn it over to Kathy and well, sure. give your impressions. Yeah, thank you. And um, you know, it was a great um, set of discussions, and I can't tell you how honored I was to be included in it. Um, I have to say, there are two organizations in this world who could call out and say, we need to get some high-powered people in a room to solve some problems and get the gathering that, that CSIS did. It's, of course, CSIS and the Chicago Council. Um, it was amazing to see the, the firepower around the table and the passion and the perspective and the experience. And I, I think that when you look at the report, that will definitely shine through. You know, I think you have from you know, the panel, you've got a, a perspective from, from business, and I'm not surprised sitting in Chicago, in terms of how we've been engaging in this discussion, um, more so recently than, than ever before. I think that we, we were just talking earlier that the world is changing, and if, if you would have asked anyone from Abbott 10 years ago, you know, where, do you, where's your most important mar where are your most important markets, what are your biggest challenges, it'd be very different from what you're hearing today. Um, we do over 50% of our business outside the United States now. Emerging markets are critically important. And when you think about the business strategies that, that we're using to, to go into these markets and be successful, a component that we are using is how to engage locally, and it's not through philanthropy. And there's been this migration of how, to, how does someone in my role in corporate responsibility or global citizenship engage with the business to make a meaningful impact? really to get at some of these critical challenges. It's about poverty of alleviation. It's about building capacity, human capacity, supply chains. And they're in areas where we've, we've always engaged in the past in terms of working with suppliers to build up um, standards and quality. But what we're looking at right now is the role of business. When we are acting not as a charity, but a, as a business, we can have a far greater impact on society than in, in any other way. So this study really pulls from the private sector and our perspective and how we can engage for the long term in emerging markets to really invest locally to build that capacity, not charitable, but in ways that invest in society in a meaningful way, that deliver um, skilled workers, good processes. And it's, it's really, I think, a great role for the private sector going forward. Well, um, can, can you all hear? Okay. I'm John Hamry. Uh, I'm at CSIS. And uh, uh, first of all, I just got to tell you how, how happy I am to be in Chicago. It's so nice to be out of Washington. I mean, <laughs> God, everything is great here. I mean, it's pretty crappy it's there. The uh, well, that was off the record. Um, <laughs> uh, but thank you for inviting us out. And thank you for the work that the Chicago Council does. And I especially want to say thank you for the genuinely pioneering work you're doing on, on, on food security. 
that is so precious to have you take the lead on that. And it's, not, it's really important work for the world. So just, uh, just say thank you for what you're doing. Um, my role tonight is really to bring this report alive by bringing these two commissioners alive for us. You can read a report, but it's dull. What you really want to hear is their stories. What, it, what motivated them to want to be a part of this? And let, let me frame it with just two observations. Uh, I, I was a defense guy. I spent 25 years of my life really in the defense business. Uh, you know, and the military, I'm very proud of it, but we didn't win the Cold War. The Cold War, w the way America won the Cold War was the, was the power of good ideas opportunity, that, that we offered the world opportunities, and we were going to make sure the world was safe until they could realize it. And the opportunities in America, it's not the opportunity to work in the government, it's the opportunity to better your own life in the private sector. That's what stimulates the world. That's what makes America such a powerful beacon in the world. And Tom was saying this, and I'm going to ask him to, to, to speak to this, that uh, American private sector is such a beacon for the rest of the world. It embodies everything that we hold dear in America and is the best spokesman for America's best values. That's not how we understand it in Washington. We, uh, we, we think about development as, you know, how much money is in the USAID budget. Well, that's trivial compared to what is being spent by American businesses creating profitable enterprises around the world and carrying the flag of American values. So that's what this project was about, was to try to find a way where we can see the goal of development, after all, is better societies, better, healthier communities, healthier people. That's a goal that Republicans want and Democrats want. That's a goal that conservatives want and liberals want. We all want that, and the private sector is doing it every day, but the government doesn't understand it. So the goal here was to try to find, can we find a way to harness the powerful energy that's inside the private sector that's trying to make money? That's good, that's not a bad thing, but to also do good in the world. So, let, so let's, let's bring this out. Kathy, we, we spoke a little bit earlier today about the work that you and Abbott are doing in Tanzania. Just share mm -hmm. that story with people. Sure. We were talking a little bit about, you know, Abbott has two ways to engage. It's through the business, which is very, very powerful, but it's also how we do our philanthropy and really test out some ideas that we later apply to our business endeavors. And about 10 years ago, our chairman and CEO went to Tanzania and he initiated a, a significant investment in building out the country's healthcare infrastructure. To date, we've invested about $100 million in that infrastructure to great return. Not only are there networks of labs around the country, but there is a very robust now central hospital in Dar es Salaam and it's called Muhimbili National Hospital. It's a place where people really literally went to die. It was rat infested and you could see that the biggest business in the area was the coffin business that was across the street. It was quite tragic. Once the investment started to play out and there was an, an emergency medical center, there was a training um, program for five, ten years for emergency medical doctors and doctors at large and nurses. There was also a central pathology lab that started to operate. And over time, what we saw is that pathology tests were no longer sent to South Africa. They were held at Muhimbili and they were done. And, and, and patients were getting a return on um, what their tests were within you know, minutes instead of weeks. Um, we started to see that people were not only um, surviving um, you know, what various diseases, they were coming back to show the doctors that not only are they healthier, but their families are healthier. And what has happened over time is working with the hospital, we've now had business units created because there is a lot of economic activity happening in East Africa. And for the first time, we, we, we started to do some revenue generating programs. Instead of giving away health care just to everyone, those companies with health insurance were bringing their patients to Muhimbili. They're getting care and treatment, and they're starting to pay. And when after the first three months of this 
program to become more sustainable. For the first time, this hospital generated $100,000 in revenues for the first time ever. All of a sudden, the doctors sign contracts to stay longer. We've got uh, oil and gas companies who are now thinking about who's going to build a helipad on top of Muhimbili National Hospital so that the workers that are working on rigs offshore can, be, ac can access good health care. And you think about that kind of you know, engagement. We have now seeded market-based healthcare in East Africa, where before the government of Tanzania was absolutely burdened with a, 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 a fee that they could hardly manage. Now they're the, the, the example for not just East Africa, but most of Africa. And it's quite exciting. Tom, could you share with everyone here, this is a remarkable little vignette I remember in one of our commissioner discussions about your business model going to China and the way you are going to expand in China and the kind of standards that you are bringing that you expect workers to have and food safety and security. It was one of those examples where you see where American business is championing values that we want, but people make better lives if they work with us. Do you, would you yeah. just share this? Tom? Sure, let me try. So to give you an idea, we we have to hire 50,000 people in China over the next five years. And we've got to train those people. And, and what we're talking about is training people who come from rural areas, from farming areas. So you're, you're training them in very, very basic hygiene, behavior, things along those lines. And what's interesting about the hotel business is if we can take those 50,000 people and train them in those basic uh, ways of life, they're able to go out from there and take on jobs in many, many different industries. So w the way we think about it is we need to hire these 50,000 people, we need to train these 50,000 people, and what's important to us, and this is our strategy is different from some of our competitors, is we don't want to open a Hyatt hotel without there being a certain amount of Hyatt DNA in that hotel. That means that we've got to generate Hyatt DNA in another hotel in China and then take some of those people, put them in the new hotel, and then they will begin to train the other, their co-workers who haven't had exposure to us. I, know, I think we are typical of an American company in the sense that what I mean by Hyatt DNA goes to the issue of values, it goes to the issue of corporate culture, it goes to the issues of how you deal with fellow workers, whether they're above you, next to you, or below you, it goes to how you engage with customers, and so when I say Hyatt DNA, that's what I mean. And um, the, the opportunity is to actually put American values, now some of the Chinese may not like the term American values, but I think there's some very important aspects of American values that are universal. They are not, there are values that are not universal. I think the idea of mutual respect, is a, as an example, is a universal value. I think the idea of having fun in the workplace is a universal value. And so if you can create that culture, if we can actually take 50,000 people and inculcate that, that culture in them, and then you're, they are going to spread out through Chinese uh, society, I think we can actually do something that, that makes a difference in Chinese society. Okay, so I, ho I hope you, you heard uh, here these two very different experiences, two corporate experiences, but they shared exactly the same thing, that, that when the company, American company, goes overseas, it champions the goals that people want for themselves. It's how they make money. But it's also good for America. It, this is the foundation for how America advanced during the Cold War. It wasn't because we gave better lectures about freedom and democracy. 
is because we gave real opportunities to the world. And we had, in this example here, where we're not giving you a lecture about it, but here's, here's what it takes to run a good quality business, a first-line business. Both of you have been doing that. But Tom, let me ask you, there's a, you brought to this commission a special interest and focus on trying to use the power of the private sector to help in war-torn areas, uh, especially in Iraq. And I know you're personally doing that. But sh t share with the group what you're doing in Iraq, how you've seen this as an opportunity, and what you're currently working on. Okay. So just a uh, quick background. Margot and I have spent a huge amount of time in very rural areas throughout Asia. So whether it is India or Thailand or Nepal or Tibet, we've, we've spent a lot of our lives actually in that environment. And what you see in those environments is no different, maybe the way to do it, Clinton. It's the economy stupid. He came into the, he became, he was elected president of the United States on a core concept of it's all about the economy. That is no different when you go into the rural areas of the Himalayas or if you go into India. That's what people want out of life. They want, they want to be able to take care of their kids, etc. cetera. So um, I, I ended up going to Iraq twice during the war. Uh, it was with a, a task force who, whose responsibility was commercial stabilization operations. So basically, Petraeus, when he came in, had the notion that the way counterinsurgency, a critical element of counterinsurgency, is build the economy. Build the economy on a local basis. Have a team that can go into the village, get the factory reopened, get employment going again, instill hope in those people in their future, and they will then tell you who the bad guy is. You don't have to give all sorts of intelligence, etc. They'll say, that guy over there, that's the guy you gotta go get. So the DOD formed this task force, and I went with them uh, twice in 2008. So this was, this was when the surge was really turning things around in Iraq. And what you saw was fascinating. When we first went into Iraq, you, you heard about the mistakes of debathification and of basically uh, firing everybody in the military. What you may not have heard about was we basically closed any entity that was a state-owned entity. That was everything. Everything was state-owned. So we closed modern factories, we closed efficient factories, we closed important factories. And what Petraeus and this task force did was they went around and got those reopened. And what I saw was people who were educated, people who, were, who wanted to work, people who were not radicalized, they just want, they needed to earn a living. So when we closed those factories, we generated we generated insurgents because they needed that several hundred dollars that they got if they went and put an eye, uh, a bomb on the roadside. From that experience, two things came out of it. The first thing that came out of it was a real passion around the idea that we could go into failed or failing states and make a difference, we, the United States, by developing strategies to build their economy. If you want to pick Iraq or you want to pick Yemen or pick your favorite failed or failing state, what they re go to Egypt. What they really need today is an economic model that they can begin to roll out to build out their economy. I don't care which party's in power or who it is, that's what they need to do. So I look at what we do at Hyatt and it's not connected to the government. We go and do this, and we don't, we don't go to the embassy, we don't go to any of these uh, government agencies. I was gonna say the Commerce Department, but I decided to spare one of my relatives. <laughs> um, and, and we just go do it. It's disconnected from the government. If we could connect that private sector to the government so they could, they could play a role, a political role, it could be very, very powerful. So that's what I saw in Iraq is we, 
we basically turned around the situation in Iraq, in my view, uh, as a result of the surge and a major component being an economic component. So that led me to say, you know what, this is a huge opportunity. That's why in my description, I say it's the third pillar of foreign policy with military and, and State Department. And I saw it uh, very visibly. The, the second part of it is a different story. Uh, we're now building a business in southern Iraq uh, where it is just a remarkable opportunity and uh, we just open a port, we open a supply and distribution business, and the, it's the most wonderful, honestly, it's the most wonderful thing that I'm doing because the passion in that community around what we're doing. These, the, we, I took Margot for a romantic weekend to Iraq in <laughs> October, in October. Um, we have a strange version of romantic weekends, uh, but we went and had the opening of the port. The head of the port authority, the only ports in Iraq are in Basra, the head of the port authority came up to me basically in tears and he said, you know, this port that you've opened, we're not in the big industrial port, we're in the merchant port right in the city. This is the original Arab port of the seventh century. This is our heart and our soul. And this has been moribund for 35 years. And what you've done is you've, you've reignited our soul. And it was, it was just a wonderful, wonderful thing to be able to do. We were then approached by the Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation came to open the port, that ceremony. He is the single most pro-Iranian politician in Iraq. He grabbed Marco and I and he said, I understand who you are, I understand that you're Americans, and I want to say what you're doing is welcomed here, and I want to get you to do this on other berths in this port, and we welcome anything that you want to do because we've seen that you've been able to contribute to our economy. And so that's the type of thing that I think we're talking about and the opportunity. But what I'd say, John, is it's disconnected. I don't know Abbott's experience, our experience is the, the embassy just has a very hard time playing a real role, and somehow we got to get that connection put together. Yep. Okay, folks, I mean, I, what I said is I wanted to, this is the report, you all get a copy of it, but you're starting to see the life that's inside this report. And the, and the title of it is Our Shared Opportunity, A Vision of Global Prosperity. You know, the, the goal of development is to make people's lives better. That's, but that's also what's good for business. This is, not a, this is not something that is hostile. The government's interests and the private sector's interests are entirely reinforcing. But Tom, as you said, our government doesn't quite get that. They don't really know how to tap into the vast power and resources of the private sector to make a difference. And the statistics are really interesting. We spend, what, $40 billion a year on development government money. NGOs spend about a hundred billion dollars a year. And our private sector, American companies, spend two trillion dollars a year on supply chain. Exactly. Okay, think about it. I just that. add to that. So the task force, their budget was about a hundred and fifty million dollars a year. That's it. And they turned around the economy of a, of a major war-torn country. So, so it's, again, the, the, what we're trying to say in this report is there's an enormous opportunity if the American government were to realize the tremendous power that's inside our private sector, if we would help them, if we'd motivate that, if we'd find ways to facilitate that private sector for doing things. So let, let me just wrap up before, before we turn it over to Lisa. To Can I, add, Lisa. Just, I want to add one more thing because a key group that was represented in this working group were heads of NGOs. And I have to say, the NGOs are on to it. We're seeing day after day, leaders of NGOs like Helene Gale of CARE, who was on this task force, 
you know, her, her teams are coming to us saying, you know, we really appreciate the assistance the foundation has given us, but what we really want is access to your business because we believe that our beneficiaries, if we can plug them into your value chain at some point, that will have a meaningful impact for the long term. They won't just have some access to assistance for a day or a week, but they'll get the access to training and maybe a job. Maybe they're going to be suppliers or part of your sales force, and for that, they'll be able to stand on their own two feet, earn an income, and really make a difference. And what they're finding is that mainly CARE works with women and girls, is that if they can really hone those expertise you know, the, you know, training, they can really reverse the status of women in some communities. Before, before I turn to, uh, to Lisa to bring all of you into this conversation, let me raise one last question not directly inside our report, but it has grown out of every conversation we've had. Uh, and that is the, the plague of corruption that's impeding quality of life around the world. And nobody feels this more directly than American businesses. And uh, you know, a friend of mine once said that corruption is the wart on the face of globalization. It is this terrible, terrible wrenching problem. You know, we can give, in Washington, we can give countless lectures about how bad it is, but it strikes me that the champion for fixing this is going to be in the private sector. Would you each just share your company's perspective on how you deal with this problem? You're global, you're engaged, <laughs> This is a big deal. It is a big deal. It's a big deal in a, in a wide variety of areas. But I'll tell you, you know, we operate and try our, to operate in a very transparent way. We have, you know, a wide variety of tools at our disposal in terms of reporting. We have policies that that we um, embrace and adhere to, and we also have, you know audits, informal audits and official audits. We care very much about our ranking in terms of you know, corporate responsibility. And, and look, even in, when we were in Tanzania, one of the reasons why the, uh, the Muhimbili National Hospital was able to be successful is because once we set up, you know, processes that reflect our own as a business, they were able to flush out cor uh, corruption through transparency. And once we started to demonstrate to the people within the, the, the hospital what will happen when policies are adhered to and profitability uh, uh, increases, they were all for it, and they were our greatest champions, ensuring that policies were being followed to the T. And, you know, it's, it's you take that lesson and you, you think about what's going on with regard to um, how we operate our business in, in other markets. And, and, and just kind of a quick flashback to those values that businesses bring. One of the things that, that the team in Tanzania last year was most proud of was the fact that, that there was um, a case where the housekeeper had, had felt that she had been sexually harassed. And rather than kind of just scuffling over the issue and, and moving on, the head of my office there said, we're going to take care of this, and we are going to demonstrate how we are going to adhere to the same policies and practices that we use in our businesses all around the world, and we're going to keep that same standard here in this office. And they fired the person that, um, that was accused of it. And, and I called him the next day, and I said, you know, how are things going there? He said, you know what? Everyone's standing a little taller today because we stood up for what was right. We stood up for this woman who deserves to come, be able to come to work and do her job and do it without any kind of harassment. And it just goes back to the, the values that you were talking about. It, it's true in corruption. It's true in the, how we practice our businesses. And, and it, it's that, that element of transparency and, and adherence to process. Um, I would say it's a very vexatious problem. Corruption is pervasive in many of the, most of the countries in the world. And we operate at a competitive disadvantage because we won't play. And that's partly because of the law, FCPA, and it's partly because of our values. But we just won't play. But it is a competitive disadvantage. Don't kid yourself. We are losing business as a result of this. Now, we have competitive advantages as well. And so we choose to emphasize those as opposed to the disadvantage. Um, couple, of, couple of stories. 
So in Iraq, we're obviously very worried about it. So we have set up processes till the cows come home. But really, we have a secret desire. Our secret desire is that finally somebody, an Iraqi government official, comes and shakes us down, and we're able to say no. Because until you're able to say no to someone, you can't get the word out that you won't play. We've now been in Iraq for, we've been actively in Iraq for over a year. We've built a port, we've built a warehouse, we had to get as many permits as you can imagine in order to build out that port, and we've not had any, anybody come and try and shake us down. About a third of the way into the process, the government rejected our engineering report and said you have to get another engineering report. And I loved it. I thought, okay, here we go. This guy's going to shake us down. He's going to have his hand out. And I said to our partners, our American partners, this is great. Let them come at us. Let it happen so that we can advertise we won't play this way. Turned out to our great disappointment, they actually were legitimate about it. They didn't <laughs> think the report was any good, so they wanted another report. Um, I would just say well, well, the way we think about it in many places is, you know what? We're the dumb Americans who won't do this. And many countries in Europe will play that way. Most of the countries in Asia will play that way. And our view is that's okay. We, we as Americans can segment out ourselves and say we, we just won't play. Uh, but I would say, John, it's, it's, it's a material disadvantage. And the other part of it is the way enforcement is working out of Washington strikes all of American business as arbitrary. It, it's, it's a revenue generating mechanism for Washington and that, that makes it additionally difficult in terms of how you figure out how to navigate in uh, emerging markets. So I, I hope you've had a chance to see the, you know, the dynamic opportunity that lies in front of us if we think about development in a different way. Again, let's go back to the premise. Development is about creating healthier people, healthier communities, healthier nations. The government wants that. The private sector wants that. The energy to accomplish it is in the private sector, and we need to find a way to tap into that. I think this is a good blueprint. It was drafted by these remarkable leaders. I want to say thank you to both of you for participating in that. I'd also like to say thank you. Dan Rundy is here. Where's Johanna? I can't see Johanna. Johanna's back here. Yes. They were the, the ringleaders and kept this thing moving, and I want to say thank you to them, too. Lisa, let me turn it to you, and let's bring in the audience, please. Thank you for that great discussion. So we have um, some time now for questions. So please raise your hand and someone with a wireless mic will come around and we'll call on you in a moment. John, thank you. Uh, this has been a really terrific presentation. I would like to just criticize one element. You suggested that the US government is not capable or interested in doing what you suggested. I would like to uh, just pitch for a moment in 1994, in a country that was a communist country, that was a very important country to the United States, and which was an enemy of us, the U.S. Embassy in Germany, which I was the deputy, we had five years of investment promotion, bringing eight and a half billion dollars of American investment in each of the five states of eastern Germany, and has been very successful, building on the model of Liu Hughes with Eisenach, with a GM plant, 20,000 employees under the East German 1600 afterwards, but a new model. Today there are 65 com com American companies in one of those states alone. Very, very much can be done. The U.S. government did not like it. The Wall Street Journal profiled it on the front pages of the Wall Street Journal. If there's anything I can do to help you make that case, I'd be glad to do that. Well, thank you. Very much. Let, uh, thank you. And, 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 and let me just, and I and appreciate your raising it, and I would like to say that we have wonderful examples of ambassadors around the world that are doing exactly that. Kathy was talking about her, her, the, her working with the, our ambassador, a very dear friend of mine who's our ambassador to Burma. And Kathy, why don't you just yeah. share this, Kathy? Well, I'll it's tell important. you, it, it was outstanding. And it, this is a great example of real you know, partnership. And 
We, I had the honor of, of traveling with Milan Verveer, who was our ambassador for global women's issues, just after Secretary Clinton returned from his, her historic trip to, to Burma. And we were looking at some really wonderful things that were happening on the ground in that country, and how do we get investment into the hands of some of these wonderful groups. And, you know, it's really difficult two years ago to do that. So with some really innovative thinking, um, there was the Secretary's Fund at the State Department Department that um, applied for a grant from the Abbott Fund. We were able to get money to the Secretary's Fund. It channeled into the embassy, and Derek Mitchell, our ambassador there, flung open the doors of the embassy, and he's just fantastic, and he's doing exactly what you're talking about. Not only, well, only did he facilitate those charitable partnerships, but he also held the floor for saying what we really need are American businesses to come in because they bring with them more than just investment. They bring in those processes that can really build this, this country in a very positive way. So there are many examples of what you're talking about. I think that the issue is how do you take these big organizations like USAID? I know that, that um, uh, the administrator Shaw was really trying to incubate some of these new ideas, but how do you expand those, accelerate that, and get those to scale? I think that's where the trick is, so that things aren't operating so independently. Thank you. Yes, please. Mr. Stan. Uh, in, in our uh, diplomacy on the uh, Israel-Palestine uh, discussions, uh, our diplomats are uh, favoring boycott instead of uh, economic development. Uh, how would you apply your principles uh, to the Palestinian state for uh, economic development along with diplomacy to bring about uh, uh, prosperity as, as, as you indicate here? Did you want to start out, Tom? I, I, please. Uh, I'll try. It's a hot potato, undoubtedly. <laughs> Uh, what I would say is the first thing you need is receptivi receptivity on the part of the host government. We're not going to be able to go and do this in an environment that doesn't want us. But I think that if, you, if, you, if we could create the environment where we could go into a Palestinian environment and be well received, I think we could add a huge amount of value. But at the end of the day, there is a profit motive. And if, that, if that's a dirty word, then you're not going to get the private sector into it. So, so my view would be if we, I would, if, if we could, I would actually have an institution of the government that had a bunch of people from McKinsey that could go in at the beginning of it and say, here's the framework of an economy. Now, I can get you a hotel guy, I can get you a banker, I can get you a candlestick maker, and begin to execute on that. But at the end of the day, there has to be receptivity. Dr. Hammer, do you have anything to add? Well, I, I, I'd, I'd like to broaden the question first and then come back to it. And that is, it was a fascinating study that was done, oh, seven or eight years ago. Uh, by the World Bank, and it was it was a study trying to account for why are why are countries wealthy and why are countries not are poor, and is it a, is and they said let's try to see uh, ascribe is this a is this because of natural resources, is it because of man-made resources or what they called intangible resources, what accounts for wealth, is it the you know, the richness of the fishery stocks? Is it the mineral resources? Is it the, you know, is it the agricultural, is it, is it natural resources? Is it the factories? Is it the infrastructure that was built? Or the third category was intangible. And intangible was uh, things like the quality of the education system the sense of fairness and legitimacy of the courts, the stability of the currency, the sense of uh, shared purpose in society, sense of cohesiveness in shared vi uh, visions of society. Overwhelmingly, the, the cause of wealth around the world was that third category, not the first two. And if you think about that third category, that third category is all the product of good government. 
Good government is the foundation of wealth. It doesn't mean big government. I'm not saying big government, but good government, quality government. And you can see examples of quality government around us. But look at Singapore. Singapore has done a fabulous job. And it's, it isn't, by the way, it isn't democratic. <laughs> you know, but it has been quality government. Finland, uh, stock, uh, Sweden, these are quality government. And they have, they've been phenomenally successful in creating wealth for their countries. So I come back to say, I think one of the pressing questions, again with the Palestinian question, is we have to get better quality of governance in Palestine that really is going to try to produce genuine wealth in that country. I know that's a controversial thing for me to say, but I think that has to be a starting point. Thank you. Other questions? The gentleman in the back, not back, the middle of the back, with the orange tie, thank you. I want to ask a question to Kathy. Thank you very much for what you are doing in Tanzania. Everyone in Tanzania is happy to what you are doing. My question is, what is kind of challenges you have already found in the long line which you are doing that kind of business? And when you look Tanzania and the Burundi and the Gwanda and the Kenya and the Gwanda, they are working, they are coming to get treatment to the hospitals. Do you think in the next three years you are, you are going to, act to extend your services to other countries? Oh, yeah. You know, I'll tell you, it is a great model. And what we're trying to do is really carve off different aspects of what we've learned and, and export the training elsewhere, share those models. Right now, I think we've got about five more years to really embed and get this sustainability model uh, successful and on its way. It's no easy task. We made a small profit in the first three months operating, but I think we have a long road to hoe before we start claiming too much victory and moving on. What we're finding, however, is that this is a really highly collaborative space. There are lots of organizations that don't want to recreate the wheel but take our learnings and apply it elsewhere and we are offering up those blueprints to anyone who wants to have them and quite frankly we've got great um, interest by new organizations. I just met with Vanessa Carey who start, started a new organization. She's a medical doctor out of MassGen and she's going in to take um, different um, health experts to go and do training locally. I see her organization, the work of Global Health Corps and a myriad of other organizations who can take these capacities and, and, and replicate these systems elsewhere. I think the key is delivering the results and, and delivering the, 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 the blueprints in a very detailed way to say, look, this is not just about going in and if you get the equipment right or get certain parts of the um, you know, training right, but this is about an, a financial equation in terms of those kinds of investments that need to be made, the process that need to be established, and then you'll have some real su success. Thank you. Um, the young lady in the second row over here. <coughs> Yes, um, I'm thinking with the general distrust of government, which is, I think, probably not limited to the United States, um, is there not a risk that once businesses are thought to be affiliated with government policy, suddenly businesses that were welcome as entrepreneurs and as businesses may become tainted with the thought that now they are arms of some kind of governmental policy. Can I, can I take the lead? Uh, mm -hmm, I, I'd, like, I'd like to, if, if I may be the first to speak, and my, my colleagues may want to answer. I, 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 I hope I didn't give you the impression we're arguing that businesses should just be mouthpieces or champions of government policies. That, that's not what we're saying in our report. What we're saying in our report is that uh, because of the, the legal and cultural structure in the United States, American companies embody American values. We don't need to commission them and charter them to go out and do American policy. Let them go out and make, make money. Let them be profitable. They're going to find that the best way to do that is to be a good neighbor. Uh, and I think that you, you know this from your own work, companies that come in and have a, a cordial and welcome relationship with the, with the host country, they ha it, it's magic. 
I mean, their workforce is loyal, the, the, uh, the vandalism is small, it's easy to recruit people. I mean, when companies really embrace being a good neighbor in a country, that's good for business. We don't need to make that American policy, and we shouldn't try to make that American. We shouldn't ask them to advocate American policy. Have them operate overseas the way that we expect they operate here. That will carry America's flag, and that's all we have to do. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry if I misled you. I didn't mean to do that. Tom, did you want to add anything? I saw you jumping in. I guess not. <laughs> Another question. No, I would just say our experience is even if there is some initial skepticism, you create jobs, you create an environment that's helping their families, and it's very immediate. It really is their wife, their kids, themselves. You do that, and the rest of it pales. There may be something in the back of their mind, but once you have a going concern, it's, it's more about their opportunity to be part of that and grow with that than it is what's behind all of that. Thanks very much. Yes, uh, the gentleman in the middle section, that's right there. Why would you say that there's this wide perception out there that American companies only go overseas for exploitation purposes. Well, I, first of all, I, I, I don't think we said that. I mean, uh, it, what we want is American companies, we want them to have economic opportunity. It's not to exploit. As a matter of fact, companies that do go to exploit usually have such bad relations in the local community, they fail. Companies that really succeed internationally are those that become welcome partners in that country. Let me give you just a little example. One of our colleagues who was on this commission, Farouk Katwari. Farouk is the CEO of Ethan Allen. And he opened a factory in uh, Mexico. And he decided we're going to pay exactly the same wages. No difference. He said, but I also insist on the same productivity. The, when he went down to visit that factory, every one of the workers lined up to have their picture taken with him. He showed them respect because he was willing to treat them like Americans. Okay, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about exploitation. It isn't, as a matter of fact, exploitation is what's going to bankrupt a company. You know, it's becoming a valued partner around the world that makes a company profitable, and it's what carries the greatest values of America around the world. Hmm. Kathy, I know Abbott has done a lot of work at building relationships in local communities. Do you have anything you yeah, to Yeah, no, add? I would just, he would, Dr. Humray stated that so eloquently, I hate to, to, to muddy it, but it's true. I mean, I think that you'll see those, those companies that go in for a flash in a pan and short-term vision who don't um, take their policies, human rights policies, their employment policies, the standards, and their, their, their success is going to be short-lived. Great, thank you. Another question, yes. Molly O'Donnell from the Chicago Council. Thank you. Um, I, I have great respect, actually, for both of your companies. Um, having worked in several developing countries, um, the issue of corruption is the key issue. And I want to know, do you think it's really possible? I mean, you can build some great hospitals and you can build some great hotels and train a couple people, but you can't build all the roads that gets the woman in rural Kenya to that hospital. You can't create the water system that makes sure somebody isn't sick in the first place. I want to know how you as business people can start influencing the governments in those countries um, so that you can start reducing the corruption. Um, I th honestly, I think the way we can do it is by creating economic prosperity. I think it starts with prosperity because if you can do that, you can create a couple of things. One is prosperity and the other is hope. And hope is really a vital element of it, the intangible. Um, I think then all of a sudden it's not us lobbying the government. It's their people lobbying the government, and no matter what government you go to, they are increasingly sensitive to 
the wants and sensibilities of their people. You go to China today, they know, they, they may know more about their people than U.S. government knows about their people. They are monitoring all the social dynamics that are going on. And so to me, if we talk about education of women, I think that's a critical issue to, for, for developing uh, markets. I think what we can do is we can create a culture in our businesses that demonstrates role models, things along those lines, and pulls them up to a different standard of living. And I think that's then it's really up to the local community to make those demands on the government. We are, we, at the end of the day, we're guests in those countries. And we, we are very careful to recognize that we're guests in those countries. Um, but finally, it, it does need to be the local people who do this. And what we can do to help them is, is raise their knowledge, their standard of living, that, those types of things. Other question. I don't yes. know if you if you have no, a you may have a different view of no, it. No, I but completely that's... agree. I think that it's just all also about you know if you start in making certain investments in certain in certain communities and that leads to leads to job creation and starts leading to additional taxes. Those those it, it builds upon itself. It's just basic economics in terms of if you're successful and start a small amount of investment that will flourish and spur and make a ripple effect through these economies. It's not going to happen overnight. Nobody is 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 is, is thinking that. But over time, I know that when when this our company that has the capa capability of of spending, you know, well before the separation, fifteen billion dollars we spent annually to buy the things that we needed to make our products or to 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 run the business. That is so much more impactful than you know a hundred thousand here, a million here in philanthropy that isn't thinking in terms of long term. Just think the power of business. I and mean, you think that about across the board, different businesses having that kind of investment power, it, it's going to start to turn. And um, we've seen it in emerging markets and in, in economies that prior had you know, low education rates and, 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 and really terrible statistics around health. Over time, it starts to change. Yes, the guest over here in the second to last row. Thank you so much for your comments, and I'm so happy to hear you saying the business should be stepping up and has been there. And as we talk about it, it is the long-term relationship, whether it's an NGO or a business, that really makes a difference when you're partnering. And I was glad to hear you mention, Thomas, education, and I know you're involved with the Sichuan University. When I was at the World Academy for the Future of Women in China, there's the same hunger as we have here, I was working with them, and they had the same hunger for the same things we do here. But one of the questions I'd ask you is, what are you doing as companies to understand their culture? Because as we talk about the FCPA, there are the rules, and then there's the culture. And it's not just in the developing world, it's everywhere. The culture of business is very different in other countries than it is in the United States. And we have now placed our our culture, which our values and business need to be placed, so I'd like to hear that. And I'd also like to note from Thomas, if you are working with the MCC, the Millennium Challenge Corp is a governmental entity that was intended to do these kind of trade-related, country-led compacts that we could maybe bring business together to do something and using them and the U.S. Global Leadership Council or Coalition is there work going in that role? So education, understanding culture, and then working with our communications in MCC. I Thank you. Questions, Lisa, you know. that, <laughs> that's quite a tall <laughs> order. So. You go ahead. And okay. Yeah. So um, first of all, I think you've identified something that is critical, and that is learning the culture and living within their culture as opposed to trying to bring our culture and think that that is the be all and end all. I think there are elements of our culture we ought to be bringing in, but primarily, we, I see David Udall, Udall, who's gonna, about to move back over to Hong Kong to run Asia Pacific for us. He's lived in Asia most of his adult life, and so he, he lives it. 
what we've done at Hyatt is we're basically the chameleon in the, in the industry. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. We, we want to be part of a community, not just a country and a culture, but actually the local community. So I had a very funny incident. There was a panel at Davos on doing business in China. And a friend of mine was the moderator, and he chose me first, and he says, so Tom, if you were walking down the hall in the office in Chicago and you ran into one of your guys and he said, gee, I'm about to go over to do a deal in China and I've never been over there before, what advice would you give him? And my answer was, please go apply for a job at Marriott. Because if you haven't been over living in China and part of that community, honestly, we look at it and say, you're the wrong person to be doing business over there. So we, we very much want to go native. We, want, we, want, we would prefer our leaders to be locals. In India, be Indian. In China, be Chinese. We need them to understand Hyatt DNA. But the best people are people who have a foot in both, in both cultures. Can, can, the question about Millennium Challenge Corporation, and let me just, uh, is really important, and I, let me just give a bit of background for others in the audience who may not necessarily have your, your depth of background on this. Um, the Millennium Corporation was created by, uh, by President Bush Jr. Uh, when he was, it was, it, uh, it was part of his global strategy to deal with, with terrorism, honestly. And if you look at the national security strategy that President Bush uh, issued in 2003, you know, it, it, it's really quite good. And it's about dealing with the, the profound failings of opportunity around the world, that inept and incompetent governments and corruption, and we need to change this. And so his, his, the way to deal with it was to create this thing called the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Uh, and it had a different model for development. Uh, it, its model for development was uh, to, uh, uh, to validate the, f the, the, the foundations of the government infrastructure so that you know they could execute competently the grants that we were to give them. And if, they, if we decided that they were worthy of it, we would then give them large blocks of money and let them execute it. I'm a, I, I'm a big fan of the Millennium Corporation. I think it's a very good thing. Um, but I have, now I have to talk to you about the pathologies of Washington. Okay, because this was seen by Republicans as a way to undermine USAID. And Democrats saw the Millennium Corporation as a great threat to USAID. And it's all viewed in the context of our gladiatorial, you know, pugilistic mindset in Washington, where Republicans and Democrats are at war with each other over the, the mechanism of aid and the, and the amount that goes in. This is what we were trying to do with this project, to say, let's step back. The goal here is, again, forgive me, healthier communities, healthier people, healthier nations. How do we get that? Frankly, we get that with AID. We get that with the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Overwhelmingly, we get it with the private sector. So what I liked very much about the Millennium Challenge Corporation was that it provided a validation to the private sector that you, that you can invest in this company because we've spent the time to make sure that they've got the foundations of quality governance. That's a good thing. It's a very good thing. But there are some things, they only deal with 15, 17 countries. Uh, I, f I forget, it's, you know, we, we've got too many other pressing needs. We still need USAID. So let's not create this as a competition. Republicans like one, Democrats like the other. We need them both. But we also need the government to realize the real prosperity in the world is going to come through the private sector. And the government needs to figure out how to help the private sector do that. By the way, can I get on my little soapbox? It's not a bad thing to make a profit. It's a good thing. We've got too many people in government that think somehow they can't work with the private sector because they're making money. 
Well, that's, uh, that's how we pay taxes, okay? It's a good thing. We do want the private sector to be profitable. Prosperity is a good thing, and it'll be a good thing for the world. So we, we've got too much of this in this, and I would say the development community is too seized by this idea that we are pure and we can't indulge ourselves to work with the private sector because they have ulterior motives. That's really harmful thinking. That's part of what we were trying to get at with this little effort. I apologize for you. Okay, I feel better. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Yes, the gentleman over here in the third row. Thank you. Uh, what, I, what I hear you saying almost is that the government is going to screw this up. And that what you're saying, particularly like with the port, for example, in Iraq, is mainly because the government wasn't involved in this. It worked out so that the, the, the Iraqi officials came up to you and said, thank you. Why do you want to get the government involved in that? In what doing? Well, first of all, I, except, I, I'm sorry, except for just making an, uh, uh, something at the, as the ambassador was saying at, at an embassy to say, uh, an introduction or something, but it's no, almost I, no, a liability. No, no, let me just go back to say, I mean, the, this, this World Bank study clearly showed, I mean, and, and it's by a factor of three to one, that overwhelmingly the, the prosperity of nations comes from good governance, quality government. Quality government is a foundation. But what is quality government? It's rule of law, it's an effective court system, it's accountability, to, to citizenry, it's a sense of shared conviction and purpose in society. You know, it's, I, I'm not saying governments, the governments don't screw things up. Look at Singapore. Singapore is hugely successful. Uh, Finland, Finland was a pathetic backwater 70 years ago. It's a prosperous, rich country now. It's because of quality government. Quality government is essential. So it's, but we need to define what we're doing in the development world. And in the development world, I'm afraid too much of what we're doing is executing projects rather than creating competency, creating the infrastructure of good governance so that the private sector then can become prosperous. That's why, uh, forgive me for not doing a good job explaining my position. No, 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 I, 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 I'm just focusing. I was talking about having our government be involved in, in using its own and developing it. And I'm talking about the Well, I, 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 there's, I, there's a lot I admire in USAID. And these are, they're capable, uh, they're honest, uh, con they have a great conviction. But we're trapped by measuring progress by how much money we spend every year, not by what outcomes we create. And we really need to turn this around. I mean, it's just, yeah, I'm talking with, with a, uh, a business colleague today, you know, you've, you've, every businessman has an annual operating plan. You say, what are we going to try to accomplish the year? How are we going to measure it? How are we going to hold people accountable? You know, the annual operating plan in the government is, do I get my budget? You know, and, and did I spend it? I, I know I was the controller for the Defense Department. You know, I mean... Uh, you know, I, I, we, I literally set up a system where at the end of the year we move money to the time zone so we could still spend it in time before the year ends. <laughs> okay, I, you know, I'm good at that. <laughs> but that's not what's <laughs> the right thing to do. <laughs> but I was good at it. <laughs> yes, I would say I'm skeptical. I would be very cautious about whether, whether the government could actually, how they do it. I would, be want to, I would want to be cautious about, but you can devise incentives for the private sector. The government can play a role in incentivizing certain behavior and, and using that as part of our foreign policy tools, where in, in a certain place we, can, we, the government, can establish objectives and then figure out how to empower the private sector to help us achieve those objectives. So I'm not necessarily saying go start another government agency, but, but I do think somehow connecting what the private sector is doing to government goals and foreign policy goals should be possible. 
I don't think that we've actually figured out no. how that, that connective tissue, and I think that's, a, that's the next step of this, is how do you figure it out and not create a huge bureaucracy. That's why I say, I think it, it's either going to be cost effective or it's going to fail. In, in other words, if we create a billions and billions of dollars per year bureaucracy, I don't think that'll work. I don't think any of the private sector is going to pay any attention to that. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have this evening. I want to say thank you to uh, Tom and Kathy for coming out and giving us your very candid thoughts on this study. And thank you to Dr. Hamry and to Johanna and Dan for coming from CSIS and giving us the opportunity to talk about these important issues in Chicago. And um, all of you have a good night and please stay warm. Thank you. Thank you.